Thank you. The next item of business is a Members' Business Debate on Motion 10032 in the name of Carol Mochen on investing in alcohol services to reduce alcohol-related harm in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons, and I call on Carol Mochen to open the debate around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is unfortunate that today's debate is required, but I am pleased to have the opportunity to bring it to the Chamber. And at the outset, I wish to thank Alcohol Focus Scotland, SHAP and others for the briefings they have provided members with ahead of today's debate. Presiding Officer, I am pleased that the Minister attend is attending the debate and I am pleased to see some government backbenchers attend as well. However, as of this morning, not a single SNP or Green MSP had actually signed the motion. And in his speech on Tuesday, delivering a programme for government, the First Minister did not mention recently released statistics regarding alcohol-specific deaths. And yet again, we are, what we are promised is a review of strategy, a review of delivery, but action feels as far away as it ever has been. I offer these words to the Minister. If our approach to investing in alcohol services to reduce alcohol-related harm does not include accepting where we have gone wrong in the past, where we are currently getting it not quite right, then we are doing a disservice to those who already are and will become dependent on alcohol, their families, their friends and their communities. It is important that I note in total 100 uh, 1,276 deaths were attributed to alcohol-specific causes last year, 31 more than in 2021, the highest number since 2008. That is 1,276 individuals whose lives were lost before time, and their friends and families have lost a loved one. This is a public health emergency, and I think that we do all accept that. However, I join with key stakeholders today in asking why has the amount of alcohol-related harm and deaths not convinced this government that it is worthy of an emergency response? We have had no ministerial statement, no debate in government time, no real path to delivery from the First Minister or the Public Health Minister. We can do so much better. Those currently suffering due to alcohol-related harm deserve better, and so do the countless families, friends and communities who have, been, have seen too many loss, their, lose their lives to alcohol without the correct support in place. Presiding officer, taking a somewhat deeper look at the tragic announcement last week, there are further causes for concern. While male deaths continue to account for around two-thirds of alcohol-specific deaths, the number of female deaths increased by 31 in 2022. It's pivotal that we analyse this detail and do all we can to ensure that the increasing number of female deaths does not repeat itself, as well as reducing the number of male deaths, of course, from alcohol. As we see in this motion, while deaths are the most extreme form of alcohol harm, they're likely to be accompanied by increase in other harms, including domestic abuse and violence, and we know that can disproportionately impact women. I repeat, this is a public health emergency and highlight the importance of having a multi-layered response that addresses key factors, both in terms of causes, related harms and improving outcomes. Moving on, presiding officer, I often take the opportunity in this chamber to call for the reduction and eradication of health inequalities. As this motion states, the risk of alcohol harm is already greater for the most disadvantaged in society, with people in Scotland's most deprived communities reportedly over five times as likely to die and six times as likely to be admitted to hospital because of alcohol than people in the wealthiest communities. This is a devastating reality, but it is one of the, that our most deprived communities have to live with every day. Of course, Brian Whistle. I'm very grateful to the member to, to, uh, for taking the intervention. One of the stats that uh, we've looked at this before is actually um, binge drinking is less prolific in our most deprived communities than it is in uh, our least deprived communities. So it must point surely to the fact that there are less services available 
and le uh, uh, two or less deprived communities uh, because of the, 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 the the, the, the misbalance or the imbalance in, in, uh, in, in deaths for alcohol. I wonder if she would agree with that. Karen Morgan. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the intervention. Uh, my, my view on that is that it's an extremely complex uh, picture. Alcohol and a lot of our difficulties in more deprived areas is as they get, they get much less access to services. But we also have a system which builds in uh, inequalities. And so we have to look right across the board at what we can do to support these communities. Um, so in, in the impact of alcohol harm are very wide ranging and can impact anyone. But that in 2023, these harms are still felt so acutely in our most vulnerable communities is appalling. And we need to ensure an approach to tackle the public health emergency is underpinned by a desire to support those most in need. The approach needs to be preventative in its nature, tackling the root causes of alcohol harm, which perhaps comes back to the member's point. Being strong in our approach to advertising where we have the powers to do so, putting people before profits, and for those already depending, having the right support services in place through investment in our ADPs to give people an offer of hope in an otherwise incredibly challenging time. In concluding, presiding officer, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, this is not a debate any of us want to be having, but it is one that the situation we find ourselves in, it is necessary to have this debate. And it is a big debate that we need to have on government time so families and communities can see how seriously the government is taking this issue. Alcohol-specific deaths in Scotland are at their highest levels, their highest levels in 15 years, whilst at the same time there are 40,000 more children living in poverty in Scotland than there were a decade ago. The link between alcohol harm and poverty is damaging, yet it is well established. We must do everything in our power to break that link. I once again pay tribute to the first class organisation who research alcohol harm, who suggest ways through this emergency, those who provide services to those who are alcohol dependent, and are, of course our great NHS staff who always do their best to act when they are called upon. They are all part of the fight but they are being let down. They need a change of approach which shows urgency and tackles an emergency. So far, the government has not stepped up to the mark, and I implore the minister to take this opportunity today to, to come along and feedback and tell us how they will actually tackle what is an emergency for our communities. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Ms Moffin. I now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Sanjay Kohani. Mr McMillan. Uh, thank you very much. Also, first of all, as the co-convener of the cross-party group on drug and alcohol misuse and also the vice chair of Moving On Inverclyde, the local recovery charity, I want to thank Carol Morkin for securing uh, this debate. And uh, uh, Carol Morkin also spoke in the debate I had on the 14th of June regarding liver cancer. Uh, the same issues uh, relevant in that debate and, and also today. In recent years, there has been a, a greater focus given to tackling drug-related harm, which is welcome. However, many within the recovery sector have expressed concerns about the impact this has actually had on efforts to reduce alcohol-related harm. And as per today's motion, and I quote, with the reported 22% increase in alcohol-specific deaths in the last two years following the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sure that we would all agree that equal attention must be given to alcohol-related harm. Now, locally, Inverclyde it sadly reported the highest rate of alcohol-specific deaths in Scotland between 2017 and 2021, the majority of which were caused by alcohol-related liver disease. In addition, more than one in four people who live in Greenock and Inverclyde drink above the Chief Medical Officer's low-risk guidelines, placing them at the higher risk of developing alcohol-related liver disease. Now, this worrying local trend sadly reflects an alarming national picture across Scotland, as the number of people in Scotland whose death was caused by alcohol has risen again to the highest level in 14 years. Now, the motion before us today suggests that changes in drinking habits, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic, have played a part in the recent spike in alcohol-related deaths. Now, through my involvement with Moving On Inverclyde, I, I genuinely can attest to this. Now, having been a, a board member for over eight years, I have seen the organisation go through many changes in that time. And the reasons for people seeking help has also varied. And as I moved out of lockdown, Moving on, Inverclyde found that an increasing number of people were in need of support regarding 
alcohol misuse. And that was a point that the Minister heard when she visited Moving on Brookline uh, very recently over the summer recess. Now, it's easy to see that being stuck in the house for long periods of time with little opportunity to interact with others, either at home or in public settings, could lead to people drinking more heavily. It, it was always considered that other harms could follow on from the restrictions and the impact that they had on those with substance dependence is clear. Now, and the national records of Scotland figures show that 1,276 people died from alcohol-specific causes in 2022. Now, that's three people dying every single day because of alcohol harm in Scotland. Now, in, in concluding, officer, I'd like to thank the British Liver Trust for bringing its Love Your Liver Roadshow to Scotland earlier this year to help raise national awareness of the risk factors of liver disease, including excess alcohol consumption. And I hope to bring the, the Love Your Liver Roadshow to Inverclyde in the autumn so that people in my constituency can access non-invasive liver scans and learn more about improving their liver health. Now, fibroscan technology is quick and easy. It's painless and could lead to my constituents learning whether they might have liver damage and being given a letter to take to the GP for further investigation. Now, this could actually help reduce the risk factors and ultimately save their lives. Now, I do want to once again thank Carol Morgan for securing this debate because I, I agree in terms of this is a hugely important issue facing the country uh, and the, there is no quick fix. If there was, clearly that would have happened by now. Uh, and I think the motion talks about a plan, uh, but Carol Morgan in her contribution spoke about, uh, about uh, urgency and emergency. Um, urgency and emergency are absolutely accurate, but to get a plan that takes a bit of time to ensure, uh, as well as that, that wide discussion and dialogue that is absolutely critical so we can actually get to where we all actually want to be, to have fewer people in Scotland dying with alcohol-related harm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I now call Sanders Gohani to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Dr Gohani. Thank you. I wish to declare my registered interest as a practising NHS GP and to congratulate Carol Mocken for securing time for this most important debate. We have a problem with alcohol, including binge drinking, seen up and down our towns at weekends. And in my GP practice, I see many patients who have issues with alcohol, drugs, and their mental health deteriorating as a consequence. Many patients I speak to do not realize that drinking, say, two glasses of wine after work to relax and unwind equate to about 42 units a week minimum. Uh, and with 14 units being what's recommended, it shocks them, and they naturally want to reduce their drinking. So speaking to Drink Aware, I support their coming campaign to make more people aware of how much they are drinking. The SNP has been responsible for health in Scotland since May 2017, and 1,276 Scots died with families who are grieving. Alcohol-related deaths continue to remain the highest since 2008, with people in our more deprived communities suffering the most. With regard to alcohol, the SNP has tried one flagship approach, which frankly makes alcohol more expensive to those who are less well off. And the trouble is we know that they are going without food instead. The minimum unit pricing policy has now been discredited by the, yourselves. And it seems to be the only plan that the SNP have to tackle alcohol harms. So they put out a more convenient and positive spin on a Public Health Scotland report by shoehorning words like significant into the draft to claim a slam dunk success. But there is no slam dunk success. There was also a humiliating climb down when accused of misrepresenting the analysis by spinning estimates as facts. And they also implied, the SNP also implied the resounding success was based on 40 studies. This is not true. So yesterday in Parliament, Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson argues that many leading experts have repeatedly said the MUP is making a positive impact in tackling the issue. What he failed to mention, however, is many evidence-based experts who questioned the analysis. And that's why the Scottish Government and its spin doctors had to rewrite their public announcements. Furthermore, and what is clear and crystal clear is that more people more people are suffering alcohol related deaths now 
than in 2018 when MUP was introduced. In fact, men from deprived areas are drinking more with MUP in place and others are switching to spirits. MUP has abandoned dependent drinkers. If we are ever to get a grip on this crisis, people suffering from dependence should have their right to access treatment and rehabilitation. This approach, a right to recovery, is backed by frontline experts. The evidence base suggests direct intervention actually works and improves outcome. So let's concentrate on this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kohani, and I now call Polly McNeill to be followed by Alex Cohamilton. Ms. McNeill. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank my colleague Carol Mokin for bringing forward this timely debate to highlight the rising levels of alcohol harm in Scotland, which is exacerbating health inequalities and adding to huge avoidable pressures facing our NHS at huge cost to our economy. I, I believe that Car Carol Mokin is right when she says it is indeed a national crisis. Because the latest figures from the National Records of Scotland show that nearly 1,300 people died from conditions caused by alcohol last year in Scotland. And this figure has risen again to the highest levels in 14 years, up 2% from the previous year. So whilst we can all, always use different reference points and use different figures, what is clear is that the situation is getting more serious. Our most disadvantaged and marginalised communities are disproportionately impacted by alcohol harm. Shockingly, people in Scotland's most deprived communities are reportedly over five times as likely to die and six times as likely to be admitted to hospital because of alcohol than people in the wealthiest communities. The crisis directly impacts my constituents and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde to Health Board area and my local health board, the largest in the country, recorded the highest mortality for chronic liver disease in Scotland. So it is indeed a crisis. This is unacceptable and it highlights the need for urgent action to strengthen prevention and improve access to services. I want to mention in this debate the importance of facilities to help women offenders, a key focus for this government and previous governments. And the question that was raised yesterday about the 218 centre, something I know about because it was set up under a Labour administration, very, very important alternative to custody for many women but those who are alcohol dependent. It faces deep cuts, and I just wonder how it really does fit with the strategy of women's offending and the crisis that we face. Six months ago, Justina Murray of Scottish families affected by alcohol and drugs told the Criminal Justice Committee that one of the biggest barriers that prevents them from affecting change is around implementation. And she said, in Scotland, we're really good at writing down what we want to do. We have all the right things written in legislation, strategies and policies, but we do not implement what we say we will. We are good at saying what we are going to do, but we are not so good at doing what we should be doing. It's not really accountability in the system. So there are still significant feelings of treatment, care and support services. Much more immediate work is required to reduce alcohol-related harms and deaths. Long-term funding of relevant services is absolutely vital in tackling the rise of alcohol-related deaths. We need services throughout the country, and the third sector needs to be funded appropriately in order to sustain those services for the foreseeable future. Make no mistake, it is a public health crisis that should be taken as seriously as drug-related deaths. 21% more people died through alcohol than drugs in Scotland last year. We need to tackle both crises. That's clear. I think Stuart McMillan is making that point earlier on, and I agree with him. Uh, it's about time we view alcohol as one of the biggest threats to population health. Every year, alcohol costs Glasgow, the region I represent, an estimated £365 million. It equates to £615 per person. But aside from the horrific impact of alcohol and people's lives that Carol Malkin talked about, it does reflect a hugely detrimental impact of alcohol on economic growth and workforce productivity. Every life loss is a tragedy, so we must do more to ensure that vulnerable people have access to local community services and, to reduce, and the resources to reduce alcohol abuse and alcohol-related deaths in Scotland. In conclusion, presiding officer, I want to make special mention of Alcoholics Anonymous, an organisation, a fellowship that has helped millions of people. It means a lot to me personally. The mentoring system and the 12-step programme. 
It's giving me the opportunity to try and understand alcoholism and the complexity behind it. And I realise that there's no one simple answer to all of this. Uh, but I do think it's an organisation that has something to offer in terms of the overall strategy. Um, and I think Sandra Gohani talked about this, um, that these are issues across all communities and across all, all classes and how dangerous it is just to focus on one policy. It's my personal experience talking to people who have been uh, seriously dependent, almost risking their lives, but being saved by services and being saved by Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, this is the point I agree with Mr Gohani on, is that for those groups, they will literally do anything in order to um, get access to alcohol because of their dependency on it. So, in conclusion, presiding officer, there cannot be a uh, one-fits-all solution to this. We need to realise it's a com complex uh, issue. And I once again thank Carol Malkin for bringing this important debate to the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McNeil. I now call Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Julian Mackay. Mr. Cole Hamilton. Well, thank you very much in, uh, indeed, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to echo thanks to Carol Mockin for securing time for this important debate. And I think it's important that we see government time uh, in the chamber made available to this vital, vital topic. Um, I'd especially like to uh, offer thanks to campaigners who have fought tirelessly to bring this conversation to the public debate, some of whom are watching from the public chamber uh, in the gallery today. And I hope that this debate can be the catalyst for more meaningful political action and, as I said at the start, uh, government time as well. Because we, we've heard this is an emerging crisis, uh, a hidden crisis, with over 1,200 people losing their lives last year alone to alcohol-specific deaths in Scotland, the highest figure in 15 years. That is something of note, uh, macabre as it is. And behind each of those deaths, as we all agree, is an irreparable tear in countless families and communities. However, this statistic only scratches the surface of the harm that alcohol misuse is causing in our communities. I want to make it clear that when we discuss alcohol misuse, we recognise that like other forms of substance abuse, it is a sickness caused by a multiplicity of factors, such as socioeconomic ones, which I'll come to later, trauma, and even potentially genetics. It is essential then that any action that is taken is driven by this understanding, and more importantly, that we do so with compassion. Long-term effects of alcohol misuse, including long-term health and addiction issues, which can even impact future generations. At the beginning of this year, Scottish Liberal Democrat research revealed that over 1,100 babies have been born dependent on substances, including alcohol, since 2017. Alcohol misuse has other ripple effects, including the intensification of domestic abuse, child neglect, and family and relationship breakdown. I will. Frank Whistle. I'm very grateful to Alex Gohammer. Just listening to there talking about the, the impact on the unborn. Um, does he also recognise the, the or, or we are starting to recognise the impact of fecal, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder as well, and some uh, about 170,000 uh, people in Scotland could be suffering from that condition? Alex Go Hamilton. I, I'm grateful for Brian Whistle's excellent intervention. It is vital we consider the impact that you know the early days of life actually begin before birth, and the, it, what can happen in utero can lead to lifelong and life-altering consequences. It's something that I worked very closely with other um, colleagues on the Baby in the Bathwater Coalition uh, before I came to this place. Um, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is something that we need to, to talk more about in this chamber. So I'm grateful to Brian Whittle for that intervention. Here in, es in Edinburgh, it is estimated that alcohol misuse costs the city over £220 million a year. Within the last two years, there's been a reported 25% increase in alcohol-related deaths, and of course, in large part, um, caused by the strictures of lockdown and the mental health impact of that. But we can't assume that with the abatement of the pandemic, we will see those numbers abate as well. And this supports expert theories that the COVID-19 pandemic has had lasting changes in people's drinking habits, which has subsequently led to an increase in high risk and harmful drinking. The fact that alcohol misuse appears to be worsening is just one reason why we need that urgent action. And although the Scottish Government have recognised um, alcohol harm as a public health emergency, there is yet to be an emergency response. We desperately need a strategy and effective 
policies. One such policy that has been adopted, which has um, we're just seeing the impact of now is minimum unit pricing. My party did support its introduction of that policy, and there is some promising data being produced, but we need to continue to monitor the efficacy of that um, and when we're reviewing its potential renewal, which is something that will challenge all of us in the coming months. MUP, however, is just one tool that is by no means enough to tackle this issue. Alcohol services are still reeling from SNP inflicted cuts. We remember in 2015 that this government cut services or, or funding to services in ADPs by nearly 25%, which still received no real terms increase in funding according to Audit Scotland. As a result, they are struggling to maintain their service and the, the relationships that they provide and sustain amidst rising costs coupled with rapid increases in demand. This is why 36 charities and public health bodies, bodies, including the directors of Public Health Scotland, have called upon the government to urgently provide increased and sustained investment in alcohol recovery and support services. As I alluded to earlier, we cannot ignore the root causes of why people drink, of why they harm themselves with alcohol use. People in the most deprived communities are five times more likely to die and six times more likely to be admitted to hospital due to alcohol-related causes. It is a health inequality. It is also attached to unresolved tra childhood trauma, as drug abuse is as well. That is why the Scottish Liberal Democrats would establish a new specialist family drug and alcohol commission, which would offer accessible wraparound services, taking a holistic, community-based, trauma-informed approach to substance and alcohol misuse. Presiding officer, the ex experts have been unequivocal in the extensive harm alcohol misuse is inflicting upon us and their assessment of it. It is our duty then that we listen to them and we treat it with the attention and urgency and compassion that it deserves and is required. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. I now call Julian Mackay to be followed by Brian Whittle. Ms. Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too would like to begin by thanking Carol Mockin for bringing forward this debate and by offering my condolences to anyone who's lost a loved one to alcohol misuse. I also want to thank Alcohol Focus Scotland and SHAP for their tireless efforts to tackle alcohol-related harm. Every single alcohol-related death is a preventable tragedy, and this is a human rights issue. And as elected representatives, we have a responsibility to act on this. Many others have covered recovery and treatment services, and this afternoon my contribution will focus on the other side of the issues of prevention and the specific actions that we need to take to address the alcohol deaths emergency. This will inevitably mean tackling alcohol marketing, which encourages people to start drinking and drink at higher levels. We know that exposure to alcohol marketing is a cause of youth drinking. Decades of research has concluded that alcohol marketing leads young people to start drinking earlier and to drink more. Allowing the industry, industry to self-regulate is clearly not working. In a UK survey, 82% of 11 to 17-year-olds reported having seen alcohol advertising in the last month. This obviously doesn't just affect young people. Alcohol marketing encourages consumption and risk-taking behaviour among heavier drinkers, causes higher craving levels and fosters positive alcohol-related thoughts. This can seriously impact people who are struggling with their alcohol use or those who are in recovery. Alcohol advertising makes drinking seem more attractive and encourages high consumption, and restricted alcohol marketing benefits everyone. In fact, it's recommended by the World Health Organization as one of the most effective ways of reducing consumption and the health and social harms alcohol causes. Other European countries have already taken action. Ireland recently introduced legislation to ban alcohol advertising during sporting events and, crucially, events aimed at children. They are also restricting alcohol advertising on outdoor and on public transport and how and where alcohol can be displayed in shops and supermarkets. Scotland would do well to follow Ireland's lead and be bold in its efforts to tackle the proliferation of alcohol marketing. Measures recommended by the Alcohol Marketing Expert Network include restricting al advertising outdoors and in public places, sports and event sponsorship and retail display and promotion. 
These measures should be brought forward as soon as is practicable, and I look forward to hearing any updates the Minister has about timescales around upcoming consultations. I now wish to turn to the introduction of an alcohol levy. I have long believed that the polluter pays principle should be applied to the sale of alcohol. The alcohol industry makes huge profits from the sale of alcohol and they should contribute towards mitigating the harm caused by the products they sell. Retailers should not be allowed to keep the additional profits they make from minimum unit pricing and this should be invested back into prevention and treatment services. Alcohol Focus Scotland are also advocating for the introduction of an alcohol harm prevention levy. This would be raised through a supplement on non-domestic rates for retailers applied to premises licensed to sell alcohol for consumption off the premises. This is something I have raised in the past and I would be grateful if the Minister could update Parliament on the Government's current position and, put, and advise what consideration there is to bringing in such a levy. In conclusion, presiding officer, there are many actions we can take to tackle alcohol-related harm. And now is not the time for timidity or hesitation. Too many lives and too many families are being destroyed. We must act and we must do it now. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Brian Whittle to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank Callum Wilkin for bringing this debate uh, to the Chamber. Um, as we get the news that, uh, that, that, uh, that the welcome news that drug deaths have started to decline, which is excellent news, or be that they are, uh, are obviously far too high, we then are hit with the news that alcohol deaths are rising. And I think um, uh, it's important to note that those caught uh, in addiction, actually alcohol and drugs are almost inter interchangeable. In fact, especially with, with drug addiction, there's usually an alcohol a part element to that as well. And I did say uh, in my intervention to Karen Mohan, I just want to clarify that, that, in, that um, as, as um, my co convener of the Health Inequalities Committee, we heard that the, the stat that, that, that I, I was surprised to hear that in the most deprived areas, they're more likely to abstain from alcohol than the least deprived. But it's the impact of alcohol abuse and alcohol consumption is much more catastrophic uh, in, in the deprived areas. And what we, we, we talked about was that inequality of access to services uh, that, that Karen Car Mohan has had spoken about. In the last um, uh, uh, term, we all agreed to minimum unit pricing, albeit with a sunset clause. And we do need to understand why, with the introduction of that minimum unit pricing, why these figures are so stark and what impact uh, the, the minimum unit pricing has had. Because even if it has had uh, a, an impact, and I hope it has, alcoholism will not be cured by increasing the price of alcohol alone. And I am concerned that the approach of the Scottish Government has relied far too much on minimum unit pricing, and not enough has been done in, th in, in things like in education, uh, not just in direct education, uh, in, in the dangers of alcohol abuse, but also I talked about the alternatives that are being offered to our youngsters. Uh, and, and by that, the Deputy Prime Officer, you'll not be surprised to hear that those inequality of access to things like sport and music and art and drama, increasing budgetary constraints on our third sector organisation, as Paul McNeill uh, discussed there, uh, and in many cases, who, uh, third sector in many cases, are those who have access to those most isolated in our communities and, and the rising addiction numbers. I would ask the Minister uh, to tell the Chamber, if she could inform the Chamber, how she is working with her colleagues, because it will take work across portfolio, especially within the, edu the Education Cabinet Secretary and the Communities Cabinet Secretary. As I said, it is going to take uh, it's a, it's a very complex issue, as Carol Mohan said, and it will take much more than we currently are doing um, to tackle this particular problem. But I think what the Minister will, will understand is, is that across the chamber. This is something that actually unifies us. Uh, it's, it's something that we all want. Of course, yeah. Stuart McMillan. Thank for taking the intervention. That the, certainly the recent uh, visit the, the Minister had uh, moving on Inverclyde, uh, there was uh, a point that was raised by a number of the, of the, the, the service users of the organisation, and that was the, the amount of activities available within the local area. But prior to them actually being involved with 
uh, addiction, whether it was in drugs or alcohol, they didn't realise that there was so much to do within the local area. So I think that your point regarding complex is absolutely accurate, but I think trying to also kind of lay the blame that uh, there's been a lack of funding uh, in for third sector organisations or within communities is not entirely accurate. Brian, was it? I thank uh, Stuart McMillan for the intervention. I, I have to say, I, 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 I'm going to disagree with you in a specific point. I think, you know, you know obviously I, I have a, a specific interest around sport. And as I've mentioned often in this chamber, the way in which uh, we access sport is becoming, or, or sport is becoming the, the domain of the middle classes now. And the actual uh, access to that sport, how we allow that access to that sport uh, and, and many other activities uh, in the sport is something that we need to consider. Um, you know, because what's happened, I'm, I've talked about the school estate many, many times, and I think that, that, that's, that's why I mentioned the education environment, because I think that's actually a battleground where we need to, we need to tackle this and actually can uh, engender something different, uh, a different uh, interest. But, I mean, I don't think we're at cross purposes here. We're very much, we're very much in, in, in the same vein, and in, in that if we can, if we can enthuse uh, our, our, our youngsters to do something else uh, or make sure there's something on offer um, other than uh, the, the boredom I think that leads to, to much of this. Um, perhaps that's part of this, this complex response that we need, to, we need uh, and, as I say, and as I said to the, I was going to say to the Minister uh, if she could let us know how she's working with colleagues across other portfolios, especially in education communities uh, I, I would be very, very grateful. So once again, may I thank Carol Mohan for bringing this really important debate back to the Chamber, Deputy Presenting Officer. Thank you, Mr Wizzo. And I now call Stephen Kerr. Mr Kerr. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. Um, can I congratulate Carol Mohan on um, sponsoring this debate and bringing it to the Chamber? Um, and can I agree with her that I think what the evidence of the last, I don't know how many minutes we've been in this debate now, 45 minutes, is that we need a proper chamber debate in government time to discuss this very important issue. Because we all know that our country has a complex relationship with alcohol. This is not a recent discovery. This has been going on for generations. And I completely agree with what Pauline McNeill uh, read. I don't know who the quote was from. I didn't write it down, but I was struck by it. We are so good at talking about the problem we're so good at producing words and papers and strategies, but we're just not any good at delivering any change on this issue. And it's gone on for far too long. And therefore, I absolutely echo Carol Mochin's comments about the need for a full debate in government time with all of the parties putting forward their ideas on what we will do to change the, tra the trajectory of our country in relation to alcohol consumption and alcohol dependency. Enough is enough. People die. People are dying. And anyone who's ever spent time supporting someone who is struggling with alcohol dependency, who is having to deal with all of the illnesses that are contingent to their addiction to alcohol, we all know it is heartbreaking. With that one person's life, so many hearts are broken. Now, I've never felt it was my job as a politician to tell people how to lead their lives. I, I just don't think that is what I see my role as. But I absolutely believe and agree with colleagues who have said it is our duty as parliamentarians to work together to create public policy that makes a difference, that enables people to make better choices. And so those who will put forward the argument that alcohol consumption is entirely a personal decision, and it's nothing to do with the government or public policy, I'm afraid that that argument crumbles in the face of the gentlest of scrutiny and all of the evidence of our life experiences. Because Sandesh Golhani, um, in his remarks, talked about the nature of the impact of this problem on families and communities and society at large. We don't live our lives as isolated beings. Uh, even, even though we have our own individual identities and our own preferences, we're woven together. I absolutely subscribe to the doctrine 
that we are our brother's and sister's keeper. And that's why we have a solemn responsibility as members of the Scottish Parliament to do something about alcohol addiction as it is impacting and harming individuals, families, communities, and our country. But, pr but prioritizing uh, collective actions or blunt instruments over individual responses is not the answer. Again, Dr. Kohani was very clear about our position in relation to the minimum alcohol pricing policy. As well-intentioned as it is, it is not meeting the need. Because, frankly, picturing someone who has an addiction is easy for all of us. Facing higher prices, what does it do? It means they do without in essential other areas and impacts other people in the process. Now, time is actually up, I think, shortly for me. So let me just conclude by saying that we need a new course. We need to, we need to chart a new course for Scotland on this issue. Enough of the talking, enough of the strategies, enough of the reviews. Let's do something. Let's invest, for example, in local rehabilitation centres across the country. Let's put help easily within the reach of every person that needs it. Help within the reach of those who are trying striving to support those who are struggling with the problem. And let's educate our young people. Let's deal with the problem at root. Let's create a better relationship between the people in our country and alcohol. And let's deal with the behaviour issues that arise from the misuse or abuse of alcohol, from binge drinking and, and other activities. Let's deal properly with the antisocial behaviour that arises because of the abuse of alcohol. Let's deal with the issues that my constituents, for example, in Falkirk, talk of excessive noise, violence, graffiti, litter left in the wake of those who've been intoxicated and who have been disruptive in the street or the community. The failure to hold individuals accountable for their behavior sends a destructive message, a dangerous message about what behavior is permissible. But failing to act we are perpetuating a vicious cycle of harm. And therefore, I appeal to the Minister to talk to her colleague, the Minister for Parliamentary Business, to see there is a full debate on this issue as soon as is possible. Thank you, Mr Kerr. And I now call on the Minister uh, to respond. Um, around seven minutes, please, Ms Whitton. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to begin by thanking Carol Mockin um, for tabling this really important motion and thank members for their considered contributions this afternoon. And from the outset, I want the Chamber to know that I do support her motion. We all agree that urgent action is needed to address the number of deaths from alcohol and to reduce alcohol-related harm. And I do offer my condolences to all the families impacted by alcohol deaths and restate my commitment to do everything in my power to tackle this public health emergency. And as a family member who was affected by this very subject, it is also very personally important to me. As we've already heard several times today, the National Records for Scotland reported a 2% increase in the number of alcohol-specific deaths in 2022. And mortality rates in the most deprived areas are more than four times as high as in the least deprived areas. And Public Health Scotland stats also show that admission to hospital was six times higher from the most deprived areas. And although these gaps are reducing over time, they are clearly still far too large. And tackling poverty must rem remain a clear focus for all of us. I'm also really particularly concerned in the reported rise in the mortality of women and in the over 65s group. And we need to ensure that our prevention policies and treatment services are addressing the specific needs of those groups and also tie them into the work across government, which Brian Whittle and, and others have spoke about. Um, and also to respond to the health inequalities experienced acutely by women, but by other groups. And also noting the increase that we saw this year in the deaths of women and by suicide. I think we need to start to look at how all of these things tie together. And whether, as Alex Cole Hamilton said, some of this does come out of the pandemic, whether this remains to be seen, to be continuing, I think we really need to keep a close eye on it. And the motion asked Parliament to note its belief that a plan is needed to address this public health emergency. And in response, I would like to set out um, the government's plan for doing so. But I agree with everybody. I think this is such a fulsome thing that we do need to find time to bring it back um, in government time to start looking at it. 
On pricing, we will soon be laying our report um, on the operation and effectiveness of minimum unit pricing in line with our commitments under the 2012 Act. And I do look forward to discussing with Parliament the next steps for this flagship policy, as well as launching a public consultation on its future. It's not one single magic bullet, um, as some have alluded to. It's part of a suite of things that we're trying to do. And minimum unit pricing was a whole population attempt to look at driving down consumption. And we know from the reports that we've seen a 3% reduction in consumption overall. But I am acutely aware of how that impacts on people who are dependent drinkers. So that's something that I'm going to keep under huge consideration. And I think that we will have a, a full debate on that when we get to it. Um, linked to that work is the outcome of our alcohol marketing consultation that closed in April. We will be publishing the findings and our ne next steps in the coming months including how we further engage on this critical issue. And um, we also will continue to keep any proposals of a levy um, under consideration. On harm reduction, alcohol brief interventions can help clinicians and patients identify harm reduction behaviours or the need for outside support in reducing alcohol intake. And we've just completed a comprehensive review of ABIs, which will be published shortly. And it will include recommendations and we will provide Parliament with details of the actions that we, will be, that we will take in response to make improvements that help reduce harm and can improve outcomes for people impacted by alcohol. The earlier that we can do that work to ad identify those who are drinking at harmful or hazardous levels, the better. And I do welcome the work that DrinkAware are undertaking in terms of actually helping people to self-identify whether there's issues. Um, and I look forward to seeing how that can work in tandem with that review of alcohol brief interventions. And on increasing access to treatment, we have asked Public Health Scotland to investigate the reduction in the numbers for referrals to services. We need to make sure that referrals are made wherever um, appropriate and that there is capacity within services to meet people's needs. So that it is really vital that we understand what is behind that data. I also want to understand, as Polly McNeill has, has um, spoke about earlier, where are the gaps in data? How do we understand how many people are engaged in fellowship organisations across the country? Because those yeah, those organisations are so vital and they just help so many people. Yeah. Brian Widow. Very grateful for the Minister to take the intervention. As I used to question the, the, the Minister, uh, the, the, drug, the Drug Minister, was if we can understand why Scotland has such a particular problem with drugs and alcohol, that would, that would probably be, well, it would be very helpful in terms of finding a solution to that. So what are we doing? Is there any work being done with the Scottish Government to understand why we have a particular issue in Scotland? Minister? I think we, we saw from the Drugs um, ta Desk Task Force the, you know, the, the findings in terms of, of, of drugs. I think some of that can be extrapolated in terms of alcohol harms as well. But as Carol Mockin rightly pointed out, it's a very complex picture. And I think that that's something that we need to continue to look at to try and understand what is driving that consumption within our communities. Some of it has to do with poverty and inequality, but a lot of it is to do with other things. We know that that increase in over 65s is particularly perturbing to me. And is, is there something round about retirement age we actually start to see people's habits um, change. So looking at that over time, um, um, I would assure Brian Whittle is, is a key thing that, that I want to do. I've got lots to get through, but if it can be, I, I can't actually, sorry. I, I don't have enough time. There's, there's just too much to talk about. And I think that talks to why we need a bigger fulsome debate um, in here. Um, we have also um, just commissioned Healthcare Improvement Scotland to take forward work to enable us to deliver our mental health and substance use plan. And the first part of this work is currently underway um, as has work um, with stakeholders to develop an exemplar operational protocol to set out how mental health and substance use services should work together. Um, and I think that it's vital given the number of alcohol specific deaths that were caused due to mental or behavioural disorders. Um, and I think that we cannot um, allow people to be bounced between services. And we also know that workforce and recruitment in particular is a challenge across all the services at the moment. And the, in the autumn, we will publish a workforce action plan on alcohol drug services to help shape recruitment, retention and service design. And this should help to create service capacity to make improvements, including establishing alcohol care teams in hospitals to identify people with underlying alcohol problems earlier. And I'm meeting with the chair of that group this afternoon. And I'm also meeting with local leaders across the country to ensure they are committing effort and resource to ensuring services are in place, accessible and effective. And I also wrote to ADPs recently to reassure them that utilising national mission resources to support services that offer treatment and support to those impacted by alcohol use alongside those impacted by drug use is welcome and any concerns that they have should be flagged to um, my officials. 
And to help ensure changes are delivered, this government has already committed to developing treatment standards to offer people better access to support, a wider range of choice in treatment in line with what was available through the medication assisted treatment standards. So the standards will be informed by the UK-wide clinical guidelines for alcohol treatment that's going to be launched in the coming months. Um, and the implementation of these guidelines and our proposed standards will provide the impetus to improving the identification and um, testing of patients who are at, le at risk of liver disease and in primary care. And as we've heard from, from Stuart McMillan, that um, is so welcome. On recovery services, we are encouraging special services to link more closely with recovery communities, um, and we continue to pro provide funding to um, third sector recovery groups. And we're also on track to increase our beds from 425 to just shy of 600 um, across um, this, this parliament, which is a 40% increase. But that also is about 1,000 publicly funded spaces, which is really important. Um, and also innovation like the Simon Communities Managed Alcohol Programme, that really seeks to drive down harm reduction for those who are drinking at the most harmful of levi uh, levels. So there's far too much in this um, that, that I can't get through all of it. But in my conclusion, um, as Minister for both Drugs and Alcohol, um, my, my role is to drive improvements and outcomes for both people impacted by alcohol, drugs or both um, and all the ways that we can help tackle the twin public health emergencies. And this government will continue to work with statutory and third sector partners to deliver this plan to reduce alcohol harm and alcohol deaths. And I will be working at pace to bring all of this together to ensure that our ambition is communicated effectively um, and I will seek to bring this back to Parliament. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. I suspend this meeting until 2 p.m. Thank you.